I am Shilpi Sharma. I am um, founder and a CEO of a company called Quantum, marketing performance company, and also a director of Fremont uh, Grand Chapter here. Uh, today, I am here to announce uh, our next uh, guest speaker. She is Michelle Zatlin. She is a co-founder and head of user experience. And people who don't know what co uh, Cloudflare does, uh, I'm sure people know what bouncers do, right? So Cloudflare is a digital bouncer. Anybody who maliciously attacks web property, they take care of it. Uh, quick facts on uh, Cloudflare. It's, uh, it's taking care of 2 million web properties uh, um, right now, has raised $72 million uh, from VCs like NEA, Union Square Ventures, and got a unicorn status last year. So uh, when I talk about Michelle, uh, she has uh, done a BS uh, business in science and chemistry, has an MBA from Harvard, um, worked with Google, Toshiba, and has built two successful startups before this. She, she has an amazing experience. Uh, last year, she was uh, nominated at top 15 women to watch in tech uh, by Inc. Magazine. So here, let's welcome Michelle. Uh, who is actually ruling Silicon Valley while creating the products we all love. Let's welcome Michelle Zetlin. And Brian Park from our Startup Grind chapter, Washington, D.C. Thank you. How's it going, Michelle? Great, how are you? Great, I'm doing really well. You guys have taken over Redwood City. That's awesome. So, you know, we wanted to, I mean, obviously this, uh, it's about right people, right product, the art of ruthless prioritization. So um, let's get right to it. You know, Cloudflare uh, is probably what I would say the biggest startup that no one's ever heard of, that's a, but it's a good thing, right? Uh, biggest, biggest startup that no one's ever heard of from the Valley. Um, and uh, when I was doing a little bit of research, I was like, wow, this is, you guys are doing amazing things. So. In just short detail, like what is Cloudflare uh, and what does it do? Sure. Um, so our mission as a company is to help make the internet a better place. Um, and that's how I always start at a dinner party and then I get a lot of huh. Uh, so what that means is our customers are anybody with a web property, a website, an app, an API. They sign up for Cloudflare and we help make sure that it is fast around the world. We protect them from a range of online cyber attacks. We make sure they're always online. So think global performance, cybersecurity, availability, load balancing, all the things that happen behind the scenes to make sure the internet works as consumers we want it, we make easy for any, any, any application talking over the internet um, possible. And so we have over 4 million uh, web properties who've signed up and 7,000 sites who sign up a day. And so everyone from um, startups use Cloudflare to big companies like Reddit, Yelp, uh, New York Times. And so it's a, it's, yeah. it, it really is catered, it's a service that anyone can use. Sure, uh, so before we go on, um, anybody who have any questions uh, for Michelle here, please go to uh, ask.startupgrind.com uh, and uh, we'll uh, look at those questions. Um, you guys you guys done some pretty, pretty amazing things. I mean, uh, including preventing the, the biggest DOS attack in history, which was like, uh, what, 400 gigabytes of, uh, of attack. And then the other thing, um, you guys uh, just recently won a Crunchy Award uh, as the best uh, enterprise startup. Um, but in fact, you probably have a better startup that's coming up soon, right? Um, probably about a month, uh, a month and a half from now. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> but I mean, what's really amazing that you beat out the, the GitHubs and the Slack of the world. So uh, that's pretty amazing. So let's talk about the beginning days. How did you start? this company from the business plan competition at Harvard? Sure, I mean, so. I literally started in your seats. <laughs> so yeah. I was in your seats five years ago. Uh, we started, it was an idea. I mean, yeah. just like every company, it was an idea that was spawned out of some, a problem that we identified. My business partners had done something called Project Honeypot. It was an open source community-based project that tracked web spammers online. And I knew nothing about web spammers at the time. But um, Matthew, my business partner, was telling me about Project Honeypot and how 80,000 websites had signed up for this thing. And I was like, what do they get? He's like, oh, we track the web spammers around the internet to know who's like a good guy and who's a bad guy. 
And I was like, what does the website get? And he said, oh, well, they track the bad guys. And I was like, I, don't, I, I kept asking all these questions. He's like, well, then Project Honeypot works with law enforcement agencies to take down the spammers so then the spam goes away. And I was like, doesn't that take a long time? And he said, yeah, it could take years. So then I went back to my original question of like, why does anyone sign up for this thing? And eventually he kind of got frustrated at me because I kept saying, why, why, why? And he said, Michelle, one day they want us to create a service that actually protects them from the web spammers and the attackers online. And I said, huh, that's interesting. And so we started to work on it. And you know, what became this idea for helping, you know, what became very clear was if you were a big enterprise, people spent a lot of money on security solutions. Um, but if you were the rest of the internet, there were no good solutions out there. They were all Band-Aid, there's nothing. And we said, the rest of the internet is a massive market. And that's how we started to work on it. It was a school idea. School, we, were, we were at business school. So it started as a school project. And by the end of the semester, I mean, I was supposed to go work at LinkedIn, which in June of 20, 2009 would have been a great job to take. Matthew was supposed to go do something. He had another opportunity lined up. And we both packed our things in a U-Haul, moved from Boston to California. Matthew drove our things across the country with his mother. <laughs> that's like the definition of scrappy startup. And we showed up in California with you know, no reputation to start working on what we were, a problem we were really passionate about and we felt like we had gained a lot of momentum. And the vision was, let's create a service that were previously reserved for just the internet giants. So Google.com is the greatest web property on the internet. It's the fastest and it's always online. They've never been offline, I mean, very rarely. Make that a service available to anybody else so everyone could be just as fast and just as safe and just as reliable as Google.com. And, and you know, five years later, we have 250 people working at Cloudflare across three offices, so San Francisco, London, and Singapore. We run this globally distributed network of 76 points of presence. Uh, we have 4 million customers, 7,000 sign up a day. You know, we make money. It's, it's awesome. kind of this idea has started to come a reality, which has yeah. been pretty cool. So, you know, again, back to this whole thing about right people, right product. You know, when you first started, you know, uh, you're sort of the non-technical co-founder, surrounded by your two technical co-founder yep. uh, of, of this infrastructure startup. So, I mean, kind of maybe you felt out of place. How, what did you do to sort of find your position into the startup? And a lot of these startups out here are sort of maybe in the same situation. What did you do? Yeah, sure. When we started, there was five of, I mean, there was three co-founders and two original engineers. And, you know, early on, the thing that really mattered, we're a very technical company. I mean, building web infrastructure is a very technical product. Um, and early on, like the coding, you know, being able to code was a huge asset. And I couldn't do that. <laughs> and so you're right, for the first few months, it was kind of like, what was I doing all day? Um, and, and what's really important that, I mean, I think I had really, I'm lucky who I picked as co-founders, was, um, you know, Matthew's skill set was totally different than my skill set, which was totally different than Lee's skill set, who was our third co-founder. And if you think of a Venn diagram, we had a little bit of overlap, so we, could had, we had a shared vision, we trusted each other, but we covered a lot of surface area. And so you're right, early on, some of my skill sets weren't super, super valuable, but you know, six months in, a year in, you know, two years in, they've become very, very valuable, and Cloudflare wouldn't be the company it is today had I not been there from very early on. And okay. so early on, while I wasn't actually coding, I did a lot of talking to protect for, for, to customers. So this back to this Project Honeypot, Project Honeypot community, a bunch of them lived in the Bay Area. And so wh while Lee and Matthew and the rest of the engineers were coding back to the office, I literally went and met a bunch of them in person to find out what do they like, what do they want to see, to kind of find out a little bit more product validation. Um, a lot of it was like, how are we going to describe what we do to customers who aren't technical? Um, and being non-technical means you really have to like, Make right. it, how are you going to say this in a way that people can understand? Right. Um, and then as soon as we had the sixth person, seventh person, and this is really important, all of a sudden I realized that everyone on the team, we only had seven people, didn't know what each other were doing. And I was like, if seven people don't know what they're doing, this is a problem. And so we started this kind of planning exercise where we'd go to, we'd plan in three-week increments because three weeks in startup life is neither too short nor too long. It's almost perfect. And every three weeks, we'd say, OK, what is everyone doing? And there'd be like three to five sticky post-it notes assigned to each person on a big whiteboard. And at Friday at 5 o'clock, 
we'd all get around and everyone would stand up and say, well, I was supposed to do these three to five things. I got these ones done. I didn't get this one done because of X, Y, Z. And at the end of three weeks, the goal was trying to have the board clear. And that seems silly, but this, this sense of accountability and ownership over what we were doing starting very early mattered a ton because as we added to 15 people or 25 people, it was amazing how much we accomplished with that small team because every week or every three weeks, everyone knew exactly what they were working on. And on Fridays, they were, had to stand up in front of their peers and say, I either delivered or I didn't. And that was a really powerful thing that, again, that, that again, something that I yeah. helped bring to the table. Right, right. Uh, I wanted to quickly, because we only have six minutes here, sure. and this topic is a really hot topic that I want to talk, because I feel like you are the right person to talk about this. Uh, again, right product, the wrong people. And you know, what I'm talking about here is this whole Apple and FBI case. Uh, um, okay. So in the past, uh, you've, uh, so you have past exposure to this, obviously, with uh, a startup that you guys um, acquired called Crypto Seal with Ryan uh, Lackey, he's a, it's a YC back startup, yep. had to basically shut down his startup because the NSA was demanding the crypto keys. So you, were, you guys were sort of like in the middle there. So what is sort of your stance of Apple? Like what, I mean, do you think they should be complying with, with the FBI? Okay, there's no way that we're gonna be able to have a conversation about <laughs> yeah, this in the next five here. minutes and 13 seconds. Yeah. But, I, but, but um, there's a couple things that I do think are important. So, yeah. um, so for some people who are like, what did Brian just say? Because <laughs> there's probably a lot of people in the audience who have no idea what you're talking about. Um, this, there's uh, a lot of things in technology come down to policy. And I don't think that I fully appreciated that when I started Cloudflare. Um, thankfully, uh, Matthew, one of my co-founders, had a huge background on that. And we've built out a great team around that. And I've learned a lot. Um, and so for all of you in there who think, oh, policy or what's going on in DC doesn't matter, that's, that's not the right frame of mind. It will probably impact your business in some way. And, and, and I think Tim Cook last week yeah. basically writing this letter to his customers and taking something that you know, Apple and the FBI have been working on for a long time, debating, and bringing it to the public eye is really interesting and right. kind of shows how important this is as entrepreneurs, as tech companies, how we have to be part of the conversation. And it's not going away. It's only going to get more complicated. And so, um, uh, you know, in this particular discussion, and again, and, and thankfully, I, it's not my pay grade to have to decide. Sure. You know, Cloudflare strongly believes in strong encryption. And so what does that mean? So if you are interacting on the internet, we believe things that H, doing things over HTTPS is better for the world at large than not. And so as a company, we make that very simple. Our customers, we make super simple to adopt that. And we're very for strong encryption. And we think long term, that's better right. for all of us as citizens yeah. um, than not, and then having weak encryption. And so that we feel pretty strongly about. What's really, what's really interesting about this Apple case is, I mean, they're not being asked to break the encryption, right? Let's be clear. On the iPhone, they're not asking to, to break the encryption. They just want to disable the functionality to, um, uh, to disable this, you know, the, after 10 wrong passwords, so it prevents it from breaking, right? So Good it's, point. it's a very yes. specific, use case. very na narrow use case. And in fact, Bill Gates had ch chimed in this morning saying that, yeah, Apple should uh, comply with the FBI. This is when <laughs> policymaking is really tricky. When you have these really edge cases, it seems easy to get hung up of what you should do. Right. The, the, the hard thing is, is it rarely becomes just a one-off. And, and what, what, how I've heard it described before is like it becomes a slippery slope where, okay, well, in this case, should, if Apple gives the data, but then in this case, they should or shouldn't, and all of a sudden, you don't have a good, a good framework for anyone to operate within. And if you aren't clear, then that makes it really hard for companies and citizens to operate, right? You need to be very clear. And so the edge case makes it very, very tricky. Um, you know, I think what... Um, Again, in this case, 
there's a couple things that you know I think are impressive. The fact that Tim Cook and the FBI are talking about it publicly and that we live in a country where we can have this discussion publicly. Yeah. I mean, I think that's amazing that they can do this and no one's getting thrown in jail or gonna get charged and that we can actually have a public debate about it and you can have an opinion and that my mother can have an opinion and I think we'll end up in a better place because of that. Right. That's really, really, really important. Yeah. Um, the other thing that, again, I, back to all of you in the audience is this is gonna go to the Supreme Court, likely, um, if they don't come to a resolution. And what the outcome of this is gonna have some impact on my company and on your company and so we should all care. So if you don't have an opinion, you maybe want to start reading up about it and start having be, forming an opinion because when the when when if if they come to an impasse where through debate and discussion they can't come to a resolution, the courts will decide, and then there will be a new precedent that we all will have to operate with under. Right. And so this is again this idea of you know DC seems like a far way away from the valley, or if you or if you built your startup in Israel or wherever it is, but paying attention to what's going on with U.S. Um, policy making. EU policy making, because there's a lot of really interesting things going on there too, is up to all of us as an entrepreneur to, to, to embrace, because it does impact our businesses, whether you think you want, whether you thought you were going to become interested in policy or not, ultimately you do. So my, my statement here, we have 45 seconds left, but I mean, there's a, there's a dis distinction between good detective work versus sloppy, bad detective work, violating civil rights, privacy rights, uh, and pretty much, you know, we don't want to encourage lazy work, right? So that's sort of like the FBI. So um, just really quick, though, I know that in the past, it, this is the crypto wars of the 90s, uh, where they had this thing called the Clipper Chip by the NSA. I don't know, maybe you guys were uh, living then um, or just, uh, old enough I'm sure many of that. these people were living then, right. yes. But it was essentially like a back door uh, where the NSA said, hey, all chips need to comply with this Clipper um, Chip. Uh, and obviously that they were going to take the crypto keys and put it into escrow, and in case they needed it, they'll, 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 they'll get it. Uh, obviously, the government lost that. So does it look like even if it goes up to the Supreme Court with Apple, it's going to look like the, the courts are going to favor Apple? Again, this is why these things are really complicated, because yeah. this is, again, uh, history repeats itself often. Um, and again, as entrepreneurs, we learn a lot of lessons from past entrepreneurs that we're inspired by. But again, on the policy side, mm -hmm. a lot of things repeat itself. and so. This is a good example of where, 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 again, when you rationally, you're like, oh, this actually makes a lot of sense, but then in practice, the key got, law, got, got leaked and lost yeah. and got into the hands of the wrong people, mm -hmm. and, and basically worst case scenario happened. Right. And so you can easily use that exact same learnings to this situation, which is why Apple is taking such a strong stance. And again, whether you agree with Apple or not, at least we live in a country where people can take strong stances and we can have a debate, so we actually end up in a place that, that's better for, for us as our economy and, and sets us up for success in the future. So I think that there are a lot of interesting lessons to be learned from the past. Awesome, okay. Well, thank you for coming out. Michelle, Great. Thank you. thank you very much. Awesome. Right. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Awesome. Okay. Yeah.